The doctors said it was much worse than they thought. Cancer had spread through my body, which would require massive amounts of radiation and chemotherapy. Hi, I'm Pastor Frank of Real Life Church, and that was a prognosis before prayer. These same doctors, just three days later, declared me cancer-free and said it was a remarkable turnaround. Jesus had healed me. That was seven years ago, and today I'm still healed, cancer-free, and going strong. I've given my testimony around the world, and the message has not changed. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I invite you to Real Life Church, where you'll experience the power of God, the power of His Word, and the power of His Holy Spirit. In the meantime, enjoy today's message from one of our recent services. As you listen, God will change your life. you to turn to uh, one place, and that is Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Before I get to Matthew 14, I'm going to read one verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Today's teaching is called the moment of a miracle. The moment of a miracle. One minute you're in despair, the next minute you're in joy. One minute you're in defeat, the next minute you're in triumph. One minute you're in sickness, the next minute you're healed. One minute you're in debt, the next minute you have overflow finances. What about that very moment when it all takes place? There is a moment that divides darkness from light. There's a moment that divides defeat from victory. There's a moment when you are sick and then you're well. I remember that moment eight years ago when I was lying in the hospital and the surgeon said, you have a very serious, very advanced stage of cancer that we cannot remove from your body. That was the moment that I was told I had cancer. That was the moment that I was told I may not recover. That was the moment that I was told it's basically hopeless. And a few hours later, the Spirit of God spoke to me the same day, the same night, and said, you shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. For I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction. At that moment, everything changed. At that moment, I felt just as bad. I felt just as sick. I felt just as sore. At that moment, the symptoms were all still there. At that moment, everything in the natural seemed like it was going on according to the prognosis. But yet that was the moment of a miracle. I just didn't feel it. I knew it. I didn't feel that moment, but I knew that moment because God spoke. When God speaks, everything changes. Now, the Word of God tells us about a moment, not this moment I'm talking about, but listen to this. He says in, in verse, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, what greater change can there be than that change? I mean, that's a phenomenal change. The dead will be raised, the people that are alive will be changed. That's a moment. He says it's in the twinkling of an eye. That's a blink of an eye. How long does it take you to blink your eyes? Sometimes when I'm preaching, I see some of you taking really long blinks. <laughs> I'm not talking about one of those long, restive blinks. I'm talking about a normal blink. It's very quick. That's how quickly this moment is. And we may not recognize that we have been in this moment because it's so fast. The only way we know it is by faith. Now, I want to demonstrate this moment to you from something that we've, you know, I preach on this a lot, but not what I'm going to say today. So I want you to pay attention. Don't say, ah, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, he's preached on that before. We're going to look at the walking on the water again in a different way. It says in verse 22, straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. When he sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. All right, evening was come. That speaks of the beginning of darkness. That speaks of darkness rolling in and all manner of evil taking place in the dark. People are afraid of the dark. Most crimes are committed in the dark. It's when you can't see, you can't see very well. A lot of accidents take place on the highways in the dark because of driving in the dark. And yet that is not the whole picture because the evening is the beginning of a new day, according to the book of Genesis. The evening is when the new day starts. 
Do you realize that the Jewish calendar, it doesn't start in the morning, it starts in the evening. Because the Lord said in the evening and the morning was the first day. And so when the sun goes down, that's when the next day starts. That's why the Sabbath begins on Friday evening in Jewish homes, not on Friday morning or Saturday morning, it begins Friday evening. So this evening, it is the beginning. It is the beginning of a miracle. What may look like the evening in your life is truly the beginning of God moving, the beginning of something unexpected. And so what happens next? It says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, so the wind was contrary. All right, I want you to look at this as this ship being our lives. This ship is our lives. And all the people in the ship, all the people in our lives. All the observers, all the family, all the church family, all the friends, all the co-workers, all the people you've ever witnessed to and are watching to see what happens in your life, these are all our passengers. The ship is our lives. The wind and the waves, they're the circumstances of life that oppose God's word. The circumstances of, of, of life. Now notice, the water is not evil in and of itself. They sail the water every day when they fish. The water is a part of their life. The water holds the future for them. The water holds their prosperity because it holds the fish. So the water's not evil. The wind is not evil. The wind is how they sail. Unless they row, the wind, they put their sail up and it blows them back and forth. So the wind is how they sail. The water is their friend. But yet, suddenly, those things which have been beneficial to them have turned against them. And what this shows us is that things that are natural can be stirred up by the enemy to be unnatural. Cancer, for example, is a replication of cells in our body that otherwise are normal cell bo body cells. But cancer stirs them up that our own body fights against us and tries to kill us. The tame turns to wild. The natural to unnatural. Normal things of life. Debt is normal in, in our lives today, right? Anybody who has a credit card, you have debt, even if it's just for a few days a month. Anybody who has a mortgage, you have debt. But yet it can turn against us. There can be simple things in our body that turn against us and we become sick. There can be foods that you love and you eat and you enjoy and suddenly something happens and you have an allergic reaction to them. There can be people in your lives that have been wonderful and a blessing to you and then one day suddenly something happens in their life, they change and they oppose you and are against you. These are the circumstances of the wind and the waves. The wind, a normal occurrence that they need every day. The waves, the place that houses their future prosperity, but they turned against them and tried to swamp their boat. The circumstances of our lives are trying to swamp our boat, trying to get our boat to sink. Because if our boat sinks, then all those that are watching us, all those that are participants in our lives, their faith sinks with it. Their expectation sinks. Their belief in what we've been sharing with them sinks with it. If the enemy can take our ship down, he can take a number of lives down. Because people know who we are, what we stand for, and what we believe. So the wind and the waves are opposing and trying to sink that ship. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. The fourth watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. Between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. You might wonder two things. Number one, what was Jesus doing out for a walk between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m.? And number two, what were the apostles doing out for a sail between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m.? It was absolutely normal. They fished at night in those days. I've shared that with you before. This was prime fishing time. When Jesus, when, when they were out of their boats washing their nets and Jesus had been teaching and wanted to borrow the boat, they were ready to go to bed. They had been out all night fishing. They fished at night. They would hang a light out of the back of the ship to try to attack, attract the fish and surround them with their nets because the fish could see the nets in those days. They didn't have monofilament. So the fourth watch of the night, it's normal for them to be up. But what happens here is that under these circumstances, normal is not working anymore. Rather than be out gathering fish, they're out trying to survive. This is what happens when the circumstances of our lives turn against us and what normally we could handle suddenly is swamping us. What is normal for our lives suddenly gangs up against us and we can't handle it. Normal, 
no longer working. And yet, at that same time, when normal's not working for them anymore, Jesus comes walking on the water. He is not affected by the circumstances. He is not affected by the wind. He is not affected by the waves. He is not affected by debt. He is not affected by sickness. He is not affected by fear. He is not affected by any need that we could possibly have, that we could possibly worry, that we could possibly obsess over. He's not affected by it. It doesn't stop him, in other words. Your debt, your fear, your need, your sickness doesn't stop Jesus from walking through the midst of it. He walks through the midst of these circumstances, through the midst of what's not working anymore. It doesn't matter to him whether it's working or not working because it doesn't affect him. So he walks through on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Straightway, Jesus spoke unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, let me come to you on the water. All right, let me come. In other words, what is Peter saying? Let me walk like you. Let me walk like you. Unaffected by the circumstances. Let me also be unaffected by the wind and the waves. Let me be unaffected by the circumstances. Let me walk in faith unaffected by the debt. Let me walk in faith unaffected by the symptoms in my body. Let me walk in faith unaffected by the fear all around me. Let me walk like you. Let me be fearless. Let me be able. Let me walk in the supernatural. Let me walk in a faith that transcends these circumstances that are trying to swamp me and sink my ship. In the midst of the darkest point in night when nothing normal is working anymore and the very things that I've used, the wind and the waves, are sinking me, let me rise above it. Let me walk like you. And the Word of God even says, if we say we abide in Him, we should walk even as he walked. He walked in fearlessness. He walked in love and compassion. He walked in forgiveness. And he walked in power and miracles. He walked by faith. So Peter's basically saying, let me walk like you. Jesus says, come. And so what does he do? He gets out of the boat. And he is momentarily inspired with a faith whose focus transcends the circumstance. He's looking at Jesus. He's looking to Jesus to walk like Jesus. He wants to be like Jesus. Let me walk like you're walking. So he's looking at him. And it's transcending the circumstance. So he's doing something he could never do before, and he knows he can't do anyway. That's walk on water. And not just walk on water in a nice smooth pond, walk on water in the midst of a wind and storm. The worst time to try to do anything new. I mean, if you're going to try to walk on water for the first time, wouldn't you kind of want a nice calm pond to walk on? He takes his first step out in the midst of a storm with huge waves and wind. But that's the circumstance he found himself in. How many of you have ever said, oh, I wish these circumstances would go away. I wish this would go away. I wish you could just be calm again. But what God is saying, don't wait for the calm. Get out in the storm. So Peter steps out, and he begins to walk. But look what happens, you know. He said, come, and when Peter came down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. What happened? What we see either gives us faith or takes it away. What we see will either give us faith or take it away. When he was looking at Jesus, he was drawing faith from Jesus. When he looked at the wind and the waves, it drained him of his faith. What we see is what we become. What we see will draw us. As soon as he stopped looking at Jesus and began to look at the wind and the waves, the old fears came back. The old ideas came back. The old inability, the old failure, the old sin, everything he used to be, everything he knew he couldn't do, everything he knew would go wrong. It all came back rushing on him like a weight that caused him to sink like a rock. While he looked at Jesus, he transcended the circumstance. While he looked at the circumstance, he became a part of the circumstance. While he looked at Jesus, he transcended the circumstance. When he looked at the circumstance, he became a part of the circumstance. 
And of course, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they were come to the ship, okay, this is the final point. And when they were come, and when they were come, and when they were come to the ship, the wind ceased. Peter did not walk to Jesus this time. He walked with Jesus this time. This is a huge change. If you had a choice to walk to Jesus or walk with Jesus, choose with. It's much more powerful to walk with Jesus than to walk to Jesus. But we need to walk to Jesus in order to walk with Jesus. If we don't ever walk to Jesus, we'll never walk with Jesus. But don't spend all your Christian life walking to Jesus. Because that means that rather than following him, you've gone your own way and then come back to follow him and you have to walk to him. When he walked the second time, when he walked on water a second time, because God is the God of a second chance, it's because now he was walking with Jesus. They came. They came. They walked together. Because what you can't do, he can. And when doctors can't, he will. And when you're weak, he's strong. And when you're sinking, he'll cause you to rise up. And when you're weak in faith, he gives you faith. He's the author and finisher. And when you don't know how, he's the way. When you don't know the way, he's the way. Or he makes a way because he's a way maker. And look what happens next, though. When you walk with Jesus, it's not a matter of just walking through the storm of circumstances. My Bible says the circumstances ceased. When he walked to Jesus, the circumstances raged, but he was transcending them. But when he walked with Jesus, the circumstances ceased. The ship was no longer sinking, was not going to be swamped. They no longer had to toil. They no longer had to row to try to make their survival. Jesus was in their boat. Jesus changed everything. Jesus caused the storm to cease. Jesus will cause the circumstances of your life to bow and bend the knee and declare that God is greater. God is greater than your debt. God is greater than your need. God is greater than your loss. God is greater than your inability. God is greater than your sin. God is greater. He's greater than the symptoms in your body. God is greater than cancer. God is greater than diabetes or whatever may be diagnosed in your body. God is greater. And the symptoms of the illness will cease And the symptoms of the storm of debt will cease. And whatever it is that's trying to sink your ship will cease when you start walking with Jesus and get him into your boat together. He was outside the boat. But when he walked with Peter, he came into the boat. Peter didn't ask him, Lord, if that's you, come into our ship. He said, if that's you, let me come to you. And then one, Jesus saved him. Together they went into the ship. Have you been saved? Have you been born again? Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. Have you been born again? Have you been saved? Have you committed your life, given your life to Christ? That's walking to him. Now, those of you who have already, start walking with him. Start walking with him. You're going to walk again. The storm may rage, but walk with him into your ship. The storm will cease. The need will be supplied. The overflow will be God-given. The healing supernatural. I walked out of that hospital three days after God spoke those words to me. Three days, cancer-free. It's been eight years. Not a trace of cancer because when God does it, He does it. The circumstances will cease in the name of Jesus. 